that I will just welcome everyone to our future Western Thessaly, Greece. Uh, this time made in collaboration with Visit Meteora and also supported by Icelandic Tourism Cluster. Um, thank you everyone who are here. And uh, by that, I will just stop to share the slide. And then we have some people who are have entered the meeting here and uh, we can start. And uh, I think it's me and uh, Chris Doyle who will have the first words here. Hello, Daniel. And, uh, hi, 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 Chris, and hi, everyone. From Gothenburg, Sweden. Cool. I am actually in the east, eastern side of Sweden, on the other side of Sweden, than uh, from Doyle. Um, so my name is Daniel Bistrom. Uh, I'm a destination designer. I've uh, been working with uh, destination development for the past 15 years uh, with community-based uh, projects, mostly in the rural parts of the Nordics. And together with me, I have my, uh, my partner uh, in crime, Chris Doyle, uh, who can present himself here. Please. You bet. I'm called the dreamer. Uh, it's been my tag for, I think my entire adult life, maybe even before then. Uh, I uh, have been involved for two decades now, destination development work, uh, experience in product development uh, around the world for tourism, adventure tourism. And like I said, I'm here in Western Sweden, the better half of Sweden. No, 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 I've spent time over with Daniel at his summer place, which you see in his backdrop there, it's incredible. Uh, thrilled to, to have this ecosystem of extraordinary people uh, contributing here today. We'll do introductions uh, in just a minute or in a few minutes with some of our, our international uh, collaborators. And George, special thank you to you for hosting this. Uh, you know, uh, I think you and Pavlos and Demetrius, you know, I've traveled throughout Greece over the last 15 years. Rhodes, Crete, Peloponnese, Caplonia, and uh, I must say my heart still resides in Meteora on many different levels. Uh, so it's, it's a delight to, uh, to be here and to, to do this Our Future with you. Maybe so we then. should uh, also start to say, uh, Chris, uh, may, to, to explain for everyone who are here now, what, what is our sure. future? Could you start to explain that? Sure. So Daniel and I, uh, since we do destination development work, uh, we have struggled, as have destinations all over the planet, on understanding how to be the most effective in hearing the voice from local people to help them self-determine their futures. And so we started a, a, a program called Our Future so that we could lend the microphone to people in rural communities throughout the planet, the places that don't ordinarily get a lot of attention, where human migration to urban centers have, have left some areas abandoned or just with less energy. So Daniel and I uh, decided that what we would do is flip the script a little bit. And instead of looking at governments to drive and provide policy and direction for destinations in the responsible tour tourism arena, we would go to locals and really work with them to hear the voices, to understand whether, when, how, why they want tourism and does it fit for them? And if so, under what terms, what conditions? So our future is designed to create this international platform so that destinations around the globe can listen in like Google Earth dive into single pinpoints on the planet and hear the realities on the ground. And then this exchange between local experts and international voices who are going to reflect on what we're hearing. Yeah, well. hmm. And, and uh, another amazing thing about this, our future concept is that yeah, cool. uh, in uh, originally we were talking about, uh, of course, visiting and that will also come uh, when we're through the pandemics and post pandemics, we are able to actually do this in, in, with uh, physical meetings. Uh, but one, one opportunity that we also have seen is to gather people who are passionate and then have, have um, expertise from, from different areas. So with us here today, uh, we have a great panel of people 
that are specialized within <clears throat> food and culinary tourism and uh, within the uh, de uh, destination development and, and um, yeah, behavior yeah, economics yeah. And, and all kinds of things. And, and this panel will, uh, will be presented further down uh, in, in, this, um, in this Our Future uh, session. Um, but uh, by, by, by that, maybe you, Chris, would like to introduce the first uh, speaker of this event. You bet. Uh, thanks, Daniel. So years ago, I don't know, Pablo, it might have been seven or eight years ago, in the mountain, in the Andorran mountains, we were connected by then Secretary General Taleb Rifai, who grabbed me by the arm and he said, come here, I want you to meet somebody and you will be friends for life. And he introduced me to you. He put us in a room, catered to lunch, and we sat there for hours. And it was very clear that he was correct. Uh, and so, Pablos, in you, I found uh, a, a fellow journeyman who's on a long-term mission to lead legacy, to create the future you want to see. And I know, you know, you you play several roles throughout Greece. You're well recognized, so your country. Uh, you know, you're, the citizens of Greece who are on this call probably already know you, but to our international guests, um, Pavlos uh, was the uh, Minister of Culture uh, for uh, Greece, has held various political positions, uh, is a private company owner. Uh, thank you for, for, host, uh, for your family hosting me for a couple of days in Keplonia last August to learn about your one of the most sustainable fisheries in, in all of Europe. Uh, that was incredible. So Pavlos, thank you for being a friend. Thanks for always picking up the phone, offering guidance. And thank you for sharing with us here, with our audience, a little bit about tourism, Greece in the future. Can you hear me now? Yeah. All right, uh, Chris, uh, thank you. The opportunity that uh, you've given me is tremendous. And uh, before, before I continue in English, I would um, ask your permission to say some words in Greek. To our Greek friends, uh, I have invited some people from various uh, municipalities around uh, Greece. And if any of them are here, I would just like to clarify some things uh, beforehand. Φίλες και φίλοι, είναι πολύ μεγάλη μου χαρά να, να καλωσορίζω στην, σε αυτή την παρέα τον, τον, τον Chris και τον Daniel. Με τον Chris συνδεόμαστε με φιλίο, όπως είπε και εκείνος, εδώ και καιρό. Και θα ξεκινήσω λέγοντας ότι αν ήμασταν μέσα σε ένα αμφιθέατρο και ήμασταν όλοι μαζί, θα σας ρώταγα πόσοι από εσά θέλετε να ζήσετε μια διαφορετική εμπειρία, κάτι λίγο πιο επαναστατικό και κάτι που αμφισβητεί το κατεστημένο. Όσοι σηκώνανε το χέρι σας θα σας έλεγαν να το κατεβάσετε και να μείνετε στη θέση σας. Στους άλλους θα έλεγαν να φύγουν από το, ότι δεν χρειάζεται να μείνουν σε αυτό το δωμάτιο. Διότι αυτό που κάνει ο Κρίς και αυτό που κάνει ο Ντάνιελ είναι πραγματικά επαναστατικό και είναι ένας εντελώς διαφορετικός τρόπος να αντιλαμβανόμαστε την ανάπτυξη της κάθε περιοχής. Ε, στην Ελλάδα γνωρίζουμε την ανάπτυξη ως κάτι το οποίο δρομολογείται από το κράτος και όλοι περιμένουμε να δούμε πού θα ρίξει την προσοχή του ε, μετά. Και συνήθω αυτό που βλέπουμε είναι ότι κάποιο υπουργό τουρισμού παίρνει τα ενία του Υπουργείου και πριν προλάβει να φτάσει στα μετέωρα, έχει ξανλύσει όλο το χρόνο στη Μήκονο, στη Σαντορίνη, στη Χαλκιδική, εκεί που πραγματικά πάει ο, 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 ο πολλή κόσμο. Λοιπόν, ο Κρή και ο, ο Ντάνιελ, αυτό που θέλουν να κάνουν είναι να βοηθήσουν οι τοπικέ κοινωνίε να, να ξαναπάρουν στα χέρια του τον πλούτο του. Να μην περιμένουν το κεντρικό κράτο, αλλά να δημιουργήσουν κοινότητε έτσι ώστε να μπορούν να αξιοποιήσουν τις πρωτοπαραγωγικές πηγές τη κάθε περιοχή. Και αυτή είναι η μαγεία της, της δουλειά που κάνουν, γιατί θέλουν να βοηθήσουν τις τοπικές οικονομίες να πάρουν κατά στα χέρια. Η, η ειδικότητά τους είναι να δημιουργούν κοινότητε ενδιαφερομένων γύρω από πρωτοπαραγωγικές πηγές. Μπορεί να μοιάζει λίγο απόμακρο αυτό που λέω, αλλά έχει δουλέψει σε πολλά κράτη. Βρίσκουν μια πρωτοπαραγωγική πηγή, όπως είναι εδώ τα μετέωρα, και αναρωτιούνται τι μπορούμε να κάνουμε για να πάμε να, 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 το πλούτο που μπορούν να φέρουν τα μετέωρα, να το φέρουν και να το μεταδώσουν σε όλη την περιοχή. Ε, και αυτό το οποίο κάνουν, το οποίο βρήκα εγώ πολύ ενδιαφέρον, είναι ότι δεν ξεκινάνε μόνο με αυτούς που θέλουν να αξιοποιήσουν αυτό το πλούτο, αλλά και από αυτούς που μπορεί να αντιστέκονται στην αξιοποίησή του. 
Και το κάνουν αυτό διότι στο τέλο τη ημέρα η στρατηγική που θα αναπτύξει για τον τουρισμό σου πρέπει να είναι συμβατή με κάθε έναν εκεί πέρα, ώστε κάθε ένα να ξέρει ότι έχει ένα μέρο, ότι του ανήκει ένα μέρο στρατηγική που έχει αποφασιστεί. Είναι λοιπόν σημαντικό ότι όλη η κοινωνία συμμετέχει σε αυτό το διάλογο, έτσι ώστε να, η ανάπτυξη που θα αποφασιστεί να εκπροσωπεί όλου. Τώρα, όπω είπε και ο Κρίνη, γνωριζόμαστε από, από τον Ταλέμπρο Ιφάη, έναν καταπληκτικό άνθρωπο που μου έμαθε και εμένα τον, τη σημασία του τουρισμού περιπέτεια. Και αυτό που μπορώ να σα πω για τον Κρίνη και τον Ντάνιλ είναι ότι δεν είναι εδώ για να εκμεταλλευτούν τίποτα. Δεν είναι εδώ για να αξιοποιήσουν μια πλουτοπαραγωγική πηγή και να φύγουν. Είναι εδώ για να μα βοηθήσουν εμά, εμά του Έλληνε, να, να δούμε διαφορετικού τρόπου αξιοποίηση του. Ε, καμιά φορά το σκέφτομαι λίγο ως ο ρεχάγγελ της, της τοπικής ανάπτυξης. Ε, κάθε νίκη δική μας είναι και νίκη δική τους. Ε, και αυτό το θεωρώ πάρα πολύ σημαντικό και δεν είναι τυχαίο ότι γνωριστήκαμε με τον Κρίς στον Παγκόσμιο Οργανισμό Τουρισμού μέσα στο πλαίσιο των Ηνωμένων Εθνών ε, από ανθρώπους οι οποίοι πραγματικά αγωνιούσαν πως ε, περιοχές που δεν έχουν αναπτυχθεί τουριστικά μπορούν να το κάνουν με σεβασμό στο περιοχή με σεβασμό στον τοπικό πολιτισμό, έτσι ώστε να αποφευθούν τα λάθη του παρελθόντος. <coughs> Πολύ σημαντικό ότι ο Κρίς είναι μεγάλος γνώστης του τουρισμού περιπέτειας, ένα είδος τουρισμού που δεν είναι διαδεδομένο. Περιοχές όπως είναι η Θράκη, η Θεσσαλία, κάποιες περιοχές του Πελοποννήσου ή η Ήπειρος, ακριβώς διότι αξιοποιεί τα πράγματα τα οποία μπορεί να είναι δίπλα μας που εμείς μπορεί να μην τους δίνουμε την αξία α, που θα, θα, θα ήταν διατεθειμένοι να τους δώσουν οι άλλοι. Και ξέρω ότι από τότε που τους γνώρισα, η μεγάλη τους ε, αγωνία ήταν να έρθουν στην Ελλάδα. Και όχι να έρθουν στην Ελλάδα για να πάνε, στο, ε, για να πάνε στη Μύκονα, στη Σαντορίνη, αλλά ακριβώ για να έρθουν στη Θεσσαλία, να έρθουν στη Θράκη. Εκεί που νιώθουν ότι υπάρχει πλούτος αναξιοποίητος που αξίζει να ε, αξιοποιήσουν και... Ε, ε, με αυτή την, σε αυτό το πλαίσιο τους καλωσορίζω εδώ στην Ελλάδα με όλη την καρδιά. Και, και πρέπει να πω ότι τους καλωσορίζω μέσα σε μια εβδομάδα που ούτε οι ίδιοι φαντάστηκαν πόσο σημαντική μπορεί να είναι για τη χώρα μας, καθότι γιορτάσαμε μόλις τα 200 χρόνια της ύπαρξής μας και ε, μ' αρέσει να τους βλέπω, σαν, ε, μ αρέσει να βλέπω αυτή την εβδομάδα και αυτή την περίοδο σαν το πρώτο βήμα μιας νέας εποχής. Λοιπόν, ε, έρχονται σε μια πολύ σημαντική εβδομάδα και από σεβασμό προς εκείνους θα ήθελα να συνεχίσω στα αγγλικά. So, um, Chris and, um, and Daniel, I, I, have, um, I have bad mouth you to all who could understand Greece, Greek. And um, uh, now it's my turn to turn in English and to say welcome to Greece and welcome to Thessaly. Uh, it's lovely to have you here. Uh, as you have already identified, it's, a, it's, it's an amazingly rich uh, part of Greece that, um, that we're talking about today, but, but the part of Greece that has not reached uh, its potential uh, on any level. Um, and um, I also said uh, in my remarks in Greece that you're coming here um, on the first week after we celebrated 200 years of the establishment of the, of the modern um, Greek nation. And in, in, in that way, it's, it's a very important week for us. It's the beginning of a new journey. and. Um, Uh, 200 years ago, people uh, like yourselves came from uh, all over the world to help Greece stand on its feet. And, uh, and they did it with a lot of love for the country, and we're very appreciative of that. But in the process of establishing the modern Greek state, they made a mistake that was, um, that was very painful, uh, painful for all of us. And that is that they established an extremely powerful Greek central state um, from which every decision had to, had to come. So powerful that 200 years later, you still need to speak to the minister in Athens in order to uh, make a movie in Meteora. Uh, you have to get permits for everything. The local government does not have um, the tools yet to be able to, to, to develop the way that uh, it and it communi its community wants to develop. And the reason they did that is because Greece uh, was established as a country in debt, both political and economic. And having a strong central Athenian government was important in order to um, pay back this debt, uh, a, a story that has repeated itself through time and time again. 
So um, in the process, when, when, when Athens collected all the, the, the power, it also collected a lot of the money. And slowly but steadily, the, 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 the richness of our countryside started, um, started subsiding. Um, I, since we know our history for the past two and a half thousand years, Greece has been organized in regions, uh, city-states, you might have heard them um, as. And uh, these were regions that were very proud, very powerful. Um, at times, uh, e even during the, the Roman Empire, the Ottoman Empire, they sustained themselves as economic and political unions, uh, units that, were, um, that, that would decide their own future. And uh, when um, in the past 200 years, we started disassembling those areas and, and destroying in the process, the richness of the Greek countryside. If you go to the Benite Museum, uh, the only museum I know that covers Greek history from prehistoric times until today, you will see that up to the 20th century, each region had its own costumes, its own headgear, um, uh, costumes that would vary tremendously from one part of Greece to the other. The, our own uh, produce and recipes, our own music, um, in, and, uh, and even our own modes of production and, and quality standards. So these, uh, the, these were very strong communities that that, that knew how to create wealth. And for the past years, and uh, as Greece has been more and more dependent on foreign money from the European Union and so forth, these regions are, 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 are pulling back. Uh, and I think it's time that we start thinking of them different. So um, uh, even in my home uh, island that you, are, that, that you visited, uh, when I was born, there were still dialects that you couldn't understand, but these are slowly um, withering away uh, as Greece is considered one nation and in the name of nation building, we chiseled away the uniqueness of the stone that we, we built with and now we, are, we have more common bricks. Uh, so we've been destroying for the past hundred years what, um, what we were like for the past two and a half thousand. And I think it's very, very important that we understand that this is something we, we, we can reverse and that it is in, very important to reverse it if we want local communities to to, to, to be independent and to, and to grow. Um, so um, I see you as people who are here to help us reverse the damage and to, to create, to, to correct the mistakes of your, of your ancestors, uh, Daniel and Chris. And uh, now that um, um, I have put these uh, humble stakes on the table, um, let me just uh, finishing by, by saying a little bit about where we are right now and, and where we need to go from here. Um, for all of you who are um, coming across uh, Greece and Greek tourism for the first time, I can tell you that um, we very often sit on amazing wealth we don't realize. Um, wealth we, 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 we appreciate sometimes ourselves, but we don't understand how it can be used in order to create identity, uh, tourist identity, I mean, and, and how it can attract people. Uh, one time, a mayor of a, of a village uh, came to me. I was sitting at the coffee shop, and he said, I want to speak to you. The, 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 the village is um, situated next to a beautiful river delta, a really gorgeous part of uh, Greece, and a, a very rich ecosystem. And he said to me, can you help me build a museum? I said, what for? He said, well, to put antiquities. And I said, well, you don't have any. And he said, well, can't you send me some antiquities from museums that don't want them anymore? The, 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 I say this story because sometimes we, we really sit on amazing wealth and we don't realize. It. And this was a mayor that was sitting on, 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 on something that could attract thousands of tourists, but still understood tourism as something that uh, where people visit in order to, to, to see antiquities and to see ancient Greece. Um, and this is very common. We, 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 be, we, we love our olives as Greeks, but we never think that people might be willing to come and visit us in order to pick the olives up uh, with us. Or sometimes um, we, we, we know our grandparents, how generous they are and how much they love to see uh, us visit their villages and so forth. But we never realize that they're heartfelt hospitality that our grandparents show us, that they show to older guests would be, would be a tourist attraction. 
Well, these, in fact, are tourist attractions now. People are looking exactly for these things. They're looking for the experience that will blow their mind, that will change the way they understand the culture. They don't want to just come to Greece and look at the Acropolis. They want to do that, but they want to experience the culture behind. So, uh, so, so the question is, how can, we, how can you do that? How can one person change um, the perception that we have until now? And the answer is one person cannot do it. One person cannot do it. But it's important that we do do it. And it's important that we do do it because our regions are losing our, our, our children. Children are leaving um, places like Thessaly to go to Athens or to go abroad. We're losing some of our most creative minds. And, uh, and the stakes are really high in order to bring um, it, 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 to bring these regions to create their own wealth and their own development. So before um, um, I, I, I give this up to back to Chris and so forth, let me say five things that uh, I've learned to unlearn uh, speaking with Chris uh, all this time. Uh, things that I took for granted that are, should not be taken for granted. Uh, the first is that the region like Thessaly should not wait. Uh, it should act. Uh, it should not ask, it should demand. And the reason is that local communities have an urgency that the central government does not have. The, the, the energy that can be instilled in a, in a local community is nothing, is, 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 is multiple compared to what you could hope for uh, in, in a Greek ministry. So if you want change, you have to demand it, you have to ask for it and, and bring it about. The second is ask, don't assume. You know, in Greece, sometimes we, 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 we associate asking for advice with, with, with weakness. We think that people who ask too many questions are weak. It's not the case. I've learned speaking with these guys, how communities that are a lot poorer touristically than Greece have managed to stand on their feet and do amazing things just by asking what is interesting to other people, um, uh, how, how you can leverage what you have in order in order to get things ama amazing things done, and and I think it's 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 important to understand that that um, uh, when when you speak to Chris, one thing he will say is your competition is not Mekonos, it, it's Machu Picchu in Peru, and it's uh, it's it's the Wild Atlantic Way in Ireland, and countries who have rain most of the year, but those are countries that have managed to stand on their feet, and we need to find out how they did it. If they can, so can we, and it's important to to know how to do it. The third lesson is, uh, it's not the, the big that eat the small, it's the, it's the fast that eat the, 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 the slow. Uh, it's, it's a lesson that, that I've learned uh, that I think is very valuable. Until now, we always thought in Greece that you have to be big in order to create things. You don't. And uh, for those of you who know, there's an island of Kalimnos where five or six guys with a great internet connection uh, made Kalimnos famous for rock climbing. And now it's one of the regions in Greece that is is, is enjoying a surge in visitors um, because they, they did things differently. And this is exactly the type of thing that, that, that Daniel and Chris are talking about. Uh, the, first, the, the fourth um, lesson is uh, when you do something like we're doing today, don't invite only the people you agree with. Invite the people you don't agree with first. Uh, get the naysayers on board as soon as you can. Um, Many of you know that um, or feel that archaeologists tend to slow down development. It's not the case. My experience with archaeologists, and believe me, I've had more than I ever thought I would, is that 20% are indeed naysayers. 60% are people who, if you bring them into the game early on, will, will, will help you and will tell you how to avoid uh, delays and how to avoid and, and, and how to move things through the process. And then there's 20% who are really inspiring people, who know the land better than any of us, who know the history and the traditions, who can, who can refer to things that you can put in your brochure and make it more interesting. They're people who love their land and can really help. You. So if you start by not inviting them, you, you, you're losing a great asset that can actually help you out. The same thing with environmental organizations, the same things with the priests in Meteora. I know there's tension there with, uh, with Kalambaka, and it's unfortunate because, because once again, we've tried to do things without them, while if we had started off by bringing them into the fold, they, they, some of them at least, they've been great allies uh, in what we're doing. 
And the final thing is cooperate, don't compete. You know, um, finally, um, uh, capitalism has, has arrived in Greece and the moment we're starting to learn the rules, uh, here come uh, uh, Chris and Daniel and they want to change everything around. And what they will tell you, and they're absolutely right, is that you're not competing with the taverna next door. Uh, you're not. You're competing with other lands, faraway lands. And no one is attracted by competition. No one. No one is attracted by two taverna guys who are fighting on who's going to get the last client coming to their village. People love uh, a tourist destination where the people will cooperate. People will make sure that you have a good time whether you go, you go to the one taverna or you go to the other. And at the end, they will tell their friends and more will come. And, and as more and more people come, there's more for everybody to enjoy. So instead of thinking in the traditional sense, these are five things that we need to unlearn really, really fast in order for everything that uh, Chris and Daniel tell us to, to, take, to, to take root in, uh, in, in, in our communities and to start reversing this thing that happened wrongly 200 years ago so that local communities can really become independent and start creating their own wealth. So good luck to all. Good luck to um, uh, Chris and Daniel. And, and, and pay attention because I've learned to love what they do and I've learned to adopt it as one of the most forward thinking uh, trends in tourism today. Thanks, th thanks to all. Pablos, thank you uh, for setting the stage. Super powerful messages. Um, uh, there's so much to comment on. I'm gonna reserve my comment for right now uh, because we have uh, two others who really have to have their voices uh, heard, but thank you for the, for the wisdom. And we'll be coming back to some of those points for sure. And thank you for the Super. comments. Thank, from thank you, Pavlos. I, I also would like to say that you have got a lot of appreciations from, uh, from others uh, joining in the chat. And then please, everyone, keep on writing in the chat. It's, it's super good to have all of your inputs who, who are joining this meeting. Thank you. Yeah, it's perfect. Uh, definitely. Uh, and throughout all of this, if questions emerge for you, please put them in the chat function and such. For all, all of you who have just arrived, welcome to Our Future, Western Thessaly, Greece. Uh, here's where we're basically doing a Google Earth, diving into a community uh, in Greece, in the Thessaly region. And now we're going from the macro level, from what Pablos just did to perfectly set the table. And now we're going to introduce another good friend of ours. Uh, we call him Pure Energy. And uh, he's a, a younger professional, but no less wise, uh, who, because of the pandemic, has been our eyes and ears on the ground, who has basically traveled all of Greece uh, and, and built up a network and really has on-ground viewpoint, taking it from what Pablo's just described. He's a bridge between, say, for example, the Meteora region and what's going on up here at the big political arena level, and he's got some keen insights. So I'd like to introduce here, Dimitris, please join us. And I'll let you pronounce your own last name so that I don't hack it. <laughs> Hello, Chris. Hello, everyone. Thank you. Thank you very much for, um, for, for asking me to join this panel. Um, yes, my, my journey in tourism, uh, I, haven't, I haven't actually traveled the whole of Greece. This is one of my one of my goals and I'm slowly, uh, slowly doing it. Uh, my journey in tourism started in 2013 when I went on to study international tourism management at the University of Brighton. And since then, my daily life, uh, as soon as I open my eyes is, is what's going on with tourism and what are we doing in, in this country. Um, uh, I have had uh, some, some experience as I was a, a consultant for municipalities, so I got a chance to see how we are promoting our country in foreign travel fairs. And since 2017, I have been focusing on creating a unique ecosystem of innovative uh, brands along the food uh, value chain and trying to find solutions, how we're going to connect our gastronomy, our food with tourism. And right now we are aiming to launch our new platform, which will feature authentic experiences, uh, food experiences all over Greece. 
um, and I'm also the board advisor of the World Tourism Association for Culture and Heritage, which is the only organization worldwide to focus uh, specifically on culture and heritage tourism, both tangible and intangible. Um, so I would, uh, I, I will move on and I will briefly take you through some facts and figures on, on Greek tourism. Uh, then I will share what is being discussed since last year when the pandemic hit us. So we are all on the same page. We will we'll end with two key subject areas which are crucial and should not be and should be taken into account in order to define our vision and agree on laying out the strategy for quality tourism and sustainable local development. So tourism in Greece has come a long way and is going through an odyssey of its own from travelers and explorers sleeping on roof because there was insufficient infrastructure in the 60s to 33 million guests in 2019. Just a couple of numbers to, to get an understanding of how uh, what the growth looks like. In 1960, we had roughly 340,000 guests. In 1980, we had 5.2 million. In 2010, that went up to 15 million. And in 2019, that went up to 33 million. And the interesting figure here is that in 2010, with 15 million guests, the expenditure per person was 640 euros. And in 2019, with double that number, 33 million, it went down to 564 euros. Um, so in terms of government and ministry, in, in 1929, the National Tourism Organization was established and was incorporated in the Ministry of Economy. The GNTO was actually the state head for, for tourism until March 1989, when the Ministry of Tourism was established. Between 1989 and 2021, we've had 16 ministers and a couple of restructuring where the ministry was incorporated in other ministries and later on uh, re-established as an independent ministry. Uh, in terms of hotel dynamics and infrastructure, there are a bit more than 10,000 hotels all over Greece with the average uh, rooms being 42. So that means that uh, almost 8,000 hotels are less than 50 rooms, uh, which, um, which makes us understand that the, the, tr the true backbone of the hotel sector are SMEs and family-run businesses. And just to get a further understanding of this, 77% of the total number of hotels in Greece are one, two, and three-star hotels whereas the five-star hotels are only 6%. Six, 6%. Uh, and here we can also see an uneven tourism distribution and planning in terms of uh, hotels. So 21% is in the South Aegean where we find also Mykonos and Sandorini. 16% alone are in Crete, which is an island by itself. 12% uh, are in central Macedonia, where we find the, the, the second biggest city, Thessaloniki. And 10% is the Ionian. Uh, nine out of the 13 regions account for less than 7% of our hotels in Greece. Uh, moving on, I'd like to also talk about economic and uh, seasonal dependency. Five out of 13 regions account for 80% of total visits. And specific regions and destinations economically depend up to 80% on tourism, which takes place roughly three to four months, and in some places, even two months. So a year's income just comes in in two months. So summer 2020, that all changed uh, when the when COVID crisis hit. Uh, our tourism receipts, the, just to get the, the an understanding of the catastrophe, in 2019, it was 18 billion. In 2020, that went down to 4.5 million with 1.5 being uh, from domestic tourism. 60% of all hotels opened and one in five all year hotels managed to stay open. So uh, this past year has been quite interesting uh, with all these Zooms, the, the only online webinars, workshops and meetings gave the opportunity to kick off public discussions involving all stakeholders, tourism personalities, public authorities, representatives, academics and other key stakeholders for the first time, but still communities representation was missing. 
sharing ideas, discussing, outlining, outlining the issues, kicking off numerous initiatives and proposing so solutions is critical and definitely a good thing. However, with the current global industry at uncertainty, the over-information, the tendency to treat fundamentals as trends and trying to convey a lot of messages while people are in survival mode and picture themselves in their business in the new abnormal, it is evident, evident that we have confusion, concerns, and many questions. As far as I'm concerned, having all of these discussions without a specific agenda or framework questions a successful outcome. So just to get, give you an understanding, some of the topics being discussed involve the following, uh, changing the model of tourism in Greece, which is music to some stakeholders ears while old school stakeholders and some entrepreneurs don't take it uh, seriously and don't kind of welcome it. And this makes absolute sense uh, wherever we have destinations and professionals that have invested invested for mass tourism models, it makes sense they, 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 have, uh, they have this perception. Uh, there are voices also expressing that we are, there are some voices, thankfully, that are express, expressing that we are too dependent on tourism and that we need to focus on other industries. Uh, this probably happened because these voices have not realized the interconnection and interdependence of tourism and how tourism can help other industries prosper. Uh, also, there are discussions about tackling seasonality and ongoing discussion for the last 10 years without actually working on strategic initiatives, policy infrastructure, etc. Uh, we are looking to increase tourism spending, uh, marketing vs management, what do you do in a, in a time of crisis, uh, DMOs, which uh, have been discussed, uh, were in discussion probably before I was even born in Greece, but uh, we, we kind of have unofficial DMOs, partnerships between public, private, some private, but no official DMO. That's uh, currently going through legislation. And there are, again, numerous ideas and case, case studies. However, many questions on how to form it, who is to join, what is, what is going to be the funding, is it going to be local, regional, or national? And most importantly, who is going to staff these DMOs? Uh, and I will, I will end with a couple more points in terms of niches and trends. Um, we are currently seeing that we, uh, there's, there is a tendency to tackle one at a time. So we have uh, committees being set up at the Ministry for Gastronomy Tourism, for Health Tourism, for dig Digital Nomads. And it seems like we are tackling these issues as they are separate boxes and not interconnected one another. And if we keep this track, uh, I think that it will take us a couple of years to go through all niche tourism forms. Uh, authenticity, of course. And we also have some, some other questionable things. Right now, during the crisis, uh, the Greek National Tourism Organization decided to outsource for the first time, its national campaign, which later on became a three-year, uh, a three-year strategic plan, which we don't know a lot about that. We're looking forward to to hear the outcomes, and we also have some other things which I recently heard about that possibly vaccinating our staff quickly will be a unique selling point and competitive advantage for this season. I think this is a very short short-term uh, way, way of thinking. And finally, we have some official and unofficial uh, predictions uh, that are saying that we will reach 50 or 60% of what we had in 2019. Uh, I, I, would I would not like to comment on that. Let's just see what happens because no one has a crystal ball uh, uh, <laughs> at the moment. So moving on quickly to uh, the first, uh, the first uh, issue I want to raise. Uh, all the above are the outcome of what we think tourism is about and therefore our perceptions. Perceptions have a lot in common with opinions since each one of us has his own opinion on every subject and therefore a perception. So understanding perceptions and taking them into account is essential in order to agree on the vision, goals and KPIs we have. Um, 
the questions we need to ask ourselves and the locals and everybody involved is what does tourism mean to you and what is tourism after all and this is an uh, this is a topic uh, that that has caught my interest since 2015 and i i did my dissertation on on british people's perception and destination image of greece uh, this this was a very uh, very interesting topic because uh, I found uh, a lot of information that British people didn't even think that it snowed in Greece. Uh, they weren't aware we have mountains. And on a question where I had different pictures of waterfalls, meteora, um, frozen lakes, uh, and I was asking where is this place, I got the whole world, and it was just photos of Greece. And for meteora, the most common uh, answer uh, somehow was China. Uh, because of the mountain formation. Um, so traveler perception is a whole other story, but today we're going to focus on how locals perceive tourism, which I believe is impacted and varies by their current role, position and involvement within tourism, the destination they are in and what types of products they are offering <coughs> and, and training and also market stereotypes that didn't come from me. So. <laughs> Um, so, just a couple of examples. I tried to uh, get away from my position. I have not carried out primary research, but this is from all the discussions I have been having. Uh, so, what does tourism and holidays mean to, to Greeks? And what, the, what comes to mind? So, primarily the summer holidays will come to mind. An island, beach, and a specific period because Greeks tend to take their holidays starting from 15th of August, which is the heart of the heart of the high season. So this is the first thing that comes to mind. And here and there, some other holidays to visit family for national holidays. And fun, funnily enough, in, uh, it coincides with what we are selling to tourists abroad, what we see as tourism as well. In terms of teenage and young Greeks, uh, they tend to visit their islands with their friends. Most of the time, and I, ha I have been doing that myself, we, we tend to visit the same island over and over again and probably the same dates. It's like a, it's, it's on the calendar. And they tend, and I did this myself, to find some part-time seasonal work in restaurants, water, uh, water activities, bars, etc., without any previous involvement in the industry or any, or, or any plans to, to stay involved in the future. And it's just a means to fund their holidays. So going now and zooming into island and rural communities, tourism basically means survival, basically means money because they are coming out of hibernation for maybe six, seven months and are opening again to the world. In terms of government, uh, tourism is a very important uh, uh, industry. It accounts for, for more than 20% of our GDP. However, it has been satisfied and considered a success if we uh, just have the scenario of increasing our arrivals one, uh, from one year to another. Um, so, and, and, and of course, we also have various stakeholder perceptions depending on the way of doing business. And here I would kind of split it into two. There is the personalized kind of doing business, which can be a small tavern, which is waiting the whole year to open up to, to bringing guests and, 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 it's, and it's his own pride and it's a way to meet people. And then we have the wholesalers, which are kind of counting heads and they just want to, to, to fill up rooms. So we can understand that these two people and these two characters, of course, will have different perceptions. Uh, something also very important is the media. So last summer, it's how the, the media perceives tourism. Last summer, it was the first time that I saw tourism uh, being uh, so many times on the news. However, the typical question when a journalist was going to these islands and talking to the locals was how many people are you expecting this year and when are you going to open? And there was no further elaboration on impacts, et cetera. And of course, uh, like we have seen through our future as well, there are the cases and perceptions of use, having tourism for, uh, as, a, as a tool for change 
and this might be to protect nature like, like we see in Rwanda, uh, like I saw in Gambia when I went to, with, a, with a university and we, we did the project on turtle conservation. Tourism can, can mean to someone's mind that I am saving my nature or I am creating uh, opportunities and building communities locally. Uh, and it's a gateway. And we see this, let's say, in the favelas of Brazil, where kids are kept out of criminality by getting involved in becoming, let's say, tour leaders. And finally, I'd like to end with, uh, with this in terms of perceptions, tourism education and career paths and prospects. Uh, there is a lack of tourism management understanding, importance and awareness here in Greece. Uh, it's, it's mostly focused on hospitality. And uh, from, from what I've seen, courses are not being broken down and there is an absence of specialized curriculum in terms of splitting it, travel management, tourism management, events, planning and development, etc. And even if some schools, universities are putting in these modules, there is a limited absorption of graduates in the specific fields within the industry. And just to give you a personal example, as soon as I came back to Greece in 2016, nine out of 10 people I was speaking to, both involved and not involved in the industry, I told them I studied international tourism management and straight away they turned to me and they said, oh, so you're going to go work in a hotel now. Um, and, and, 80 per, and, and, and in an unofficial, let's say, conversation with the Dean of Faculty of Tourism in, in one of the Greek universities, uh, she turned around and she told me that Dimitris, almost 80% of our graduates are going into hotels. And because tourism schools and cooking schools are combined, the rest 10% are going towards a chef, let's say, career. So it's an opportunity, therefore, to consider all the above, accept current reality, create a generation of tourism stakeholders who understand the fundamentals and have a background of tourism related studies. Only then we will be able to restructure, build a responsible tourism uh, con conscience and agree on the vision. And Chris, I, will, uh, I, I'm, I have my eye on the time, uh, two more minutes. Uh, now touching upon fundamentals, having mentioned the fundamentals of tourism, let's not overcomplicate things and understand them in a simple way. So let's picture tourism as a living organism, for instance, a heart, which consists of three elements, economic, society and culture and environment. Any action plan initiative we take should find the balance between these three elements and achieve a win-win-win outcome. In case one of the elements is negatively impacted, the balance is distorted and we should take action to fix it and keep the heart functioning properly. This will result in a well-balanced ecosystem and hence achieve sustainability. If we achieve the above, we will also be successful in adaptability, resilience, innovation, and evolution. Therefore, we need to treat tourism as a tool force for change and prosperity rather than just a product. Sustainability should, should also be protected and be tackled with responsibility and caution in order to avoid going down the wrong path like we saw happening with greenwashing. Sustainability should not be promoted as a phrase or narrative. Once on the right direction, its practical success will promote itself. Therefore, completing sustainability training modules, hanging on our walls certifications and PR actions could be considered a good start, but is not enough and could hit us like a boomerang and have the opposite effects. Uh, and I have some examples which maybe I can share later, Chris, if I'm running, if I'm running late. Uh, so yeah, this is uh, the main points. Thank you very much. Well, you never disappoint my friend, pure energy. And I just wanna point out Nick's comment uh, because uh, I share it. Nick says, this is the future ahead. And he's pointing to you and other young people. Uh, one of our contributors on today's panel, Jane Connolly is here. I can see her up in the picture. Another uh, younger individual and Paka from South Africa. I mean, these are the young leaders who must carry the torch for all of us. 
Uh, we can do our best to offer insights, et cetera, but we need to pass the baton. In fact, we needed to do this together to get to the next plateau of responsible development. So for all the listeners who have just joined in, for listening, uh, we will have q and We extended the program because there's so much dialogue after this, but we're going to hear from another uh, good friend of ours and the actual geographic region uh, that we're talking about here today. And uh, for Meteora, uh, years ago, maybe, let's see, now it's five years ago already, George, uh, coming down, George hosted uh, myself when I was with the Adventure Travel Trade Association. And we toured through the Meteora region, visited Tricola, visited quite a few different areas in the region. And I was just dumbfounded, dumbfounded by the fact that in one block, you get a, over a million visitors a year and just a few kilometers away, there's zero tourism. And yet the resources were equally interesting at both. And so this is something that George, we're gonna take what Pavlos offered in the big picture, the extra details uh, that Demetrius just provided and be, uh, began to bring it down. Now we're gonna get specific, real world, challenges, opportunities with you, George. Thank you for hosting us. I pass it over to you, my friend. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Chris. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for having me. It's a great pleasure to honor uh, and join this panel. Uh, I will try to briefly share with you my knowledge about the region as a destination insider. Uh, but uh, before I start, uh, I would like to invite a friend, a neighbor, and a bright example of the local administration, uh, the president of the Greek Central Union of Municipalities, the mayor of uh, Trikala City, for a brief greeting. George, thank you. Uh, good afternoon to all of you. My name is Dimitris Papasergiou, as you see, and I'm the mayor of the city of Trikala. It is a small but very calm and beautiful city about 22 kilometers away from uh, the famous rocks of Meteors. Some say that Trikala is the first smart city of Greece, but being smart is something that we have to prove every day in our real life. I have just a very short intervention, uh, very few notes I wrote down. Uh, the first uh, issue we have to face is that till now all the institutions and them uh, talking about local authorities, prefectures, municipalities, but also the private sector, uh, now we are I'm afraid following uh, parallel uh, single roads, but we must uh, be met and found in a new crossroad. And we have to fight and agree to a new holistic approach of uh, local tourism, because of tourism for sure, it is not something that just we see, but it's also something that we have to taste, we have to live, uh, we have to sense it. And uh, this is uh, a portion that is missing to our local uh, strategy of tourism uh, the last uh, years. Uh, I suppose that tourism is a combination of a beautiful place and uh, uh, triggering uh, all our senses. And uh, for our place, uh, for the famous, uh, fantastic, and unique rocks of meteors, uh, it is something that has to be combined also for, with uh, unique tastes, uh, for example, uh, it is difficult to find a place to taste a uh, monastic nutrition. Uh, it is something that I have to uh, find and uh, go ahead further. And which is the role of uh, legislation to uh, all this uh, local uh, growth in terms of protecting the environment? I'm afraid that in Greece, the last year, the years, we went from the one edge to the other. I'm afraid sometimes uh, the laws are presenting uh, new problems uh, to local uh, growth and tourism, uh, especially for the rocks of meteors, and this is something that we are discussing every day with the private sector of tourism, and, um, and uh, which is uh, finally the role of the local institutions. I suppose that we have to share the same vision. This is a point because silos is something very useful for farming, but not for tourism and uh, uh, local growth. We have to merge uh, our cooperative advantages and uh, follow a common strategy. This is something that it is missing and the new law, new tourism law with DMOs, it is just the beginning because no law at all can help you uh, 
walk the same road. It is something that has been matured by all the parts that are involved in tourism. This is something that we're discussing a lot with George and the, the people of tourism of Calabaca. Uh, it is a matter of fact, and I'm closing with that, I'm concluding with that, that Thessaly is a fantastic place. It combines a lot of uh, uh, physical beauties, uh, seas, mountains, tastes, but uh, uh, the strategy is missing. Uh, the role that we have to uh, play the next year is very crucial for our future. So thank you, Dam Stein, and uh, very totally open to learn from, from the best, as I see. Thank you a lot. Uh, yeah, that was, uh, so um, I'll try to share with you some uh, insights and uh, some knowledge about uh, our destination. Uh, we're gonna talk about the development, uh, how, how it went in the past, where we are now, uh, what are the challenges and uh, the opportunities. And I have to say that I'm really struggling if I should start analyzing the destination from the perspective of the international traveler or from the perspective of the destination development organizations. We see many public organizations are trying to promote and manage uh, destinations within certain geographical limits uh, using uh, regional borders and names that are totally relevant or, may, or doesn't make any sense to the international traveler or to the tourist market in general. Uh, now to, to, to explain a little bit the, the destination of Meteora, I will start with the main pillar and the core of the destination uh, Thessaly, which is the site of Meteora. And if I should have to describe uh, Meteora within a phrase, I will say that uh, in the era of Instagram, Meteora is probably the most Instagrammable and the most shareable place in the world. And that's not because we have, unlikely many other destinations, we have few aeons of erosion on our side, but also because this place is uh, a nature and man-made creation in a perfect harmony. Uh, Meteora is a world-class destination. UNESCO World Heritage List Monument since 1988. And I want to say here that uh, UNESCO have uh, three main categories, nature, history, and art. Meteora, uh, back in 1988, when it was declared UNESCO World Heritage List Monu Monument, uh, fulfilled the criteria for the two out of the three categories at the same time, which is nature and art, a very rare combination, very few, other places in the world can have this uh, uh, combination. And, and what means that in practice is that um, the visitors who are doing a hiking tour, like I did with Chris five years ago, and they enjoying this uh, breathtaking landscape with the canyons and the caves and the, that rare geological phenomenon, at the same time, they enter inside those monasteries that have been built uh, back in the 14th and 16th century, and they can marvel some of the finest examples of the Byzantine and post-Byzantine iconography, and they can uh, see in the museums uh, calligraphy and uh, art and the holy relics and the treasures that are inside those monasteries, which is something uh, priceless, it's something uh, unique. Matera is also an archaeological site. All the core around that rock forest is uh, an archaeological site characterized by the Greek government uh, as an archaeological site back in 1922. It's one of the oldest uh, characterized uh, uh, archaeological sites uh, of Greece. Um, it's also a natural park. It's an area which uh, has a great value for the environment, for the wildlife. It's protected as a natural park. Um, but above all, it's a holy place. It's an active monastic community over the last 1,200 years. We have that uh, special community here, the monks, uh, who are practicing their own way of life. And uh, we, we should approach destinations like this, like Matera, always with a lot of respect and uh, attention for, for uh, all, all these different things uh, that it is. Um, <clears throat> also, Matera, it is um, on the bucket list of uh, every traveler who is planning to visit the Greek mainland. And uh, um, 
there are so many activities that can uh, cover uh, a plethora of different interests, such as uh, cultural tours, a lot of nature-based activities, uh, photography, stargazing, uh, food tours. We have here truffle hunting and cooking. We, we have uh, food and wine tours. We have amazing wine estates. Uh, people here can do soft adventure activities like uh, hiking and rock climbing and mountain bike and e-bike tours, uh, or they can do cultural tours. And it's a destination that uh, can satisfy uh, so many different uh, needs and um, interests from uh, from visitors. It's uh, something totally unique. Now, regarding the connectivity of our destination with uh, Athens, for example, which is the international hub. Uh, we don't have any airport here. We don't have any international airport, but we have the privilege to have a train. And um, a train uh, in many cases is replacing uh, an airport in many destinations. And lately we have um, very good highways. So we have very good connectivity. We're right at the center of the Greek mainland. It's about uh, three and a half hours four hours maximum drive from uh, Athens and two and a half, three hours drive uh, from uh, Thessaloniki in uh, pretty much the same time you do, you do with the train. But uh, within the next couple of years, we're gonna have uh, even better um, uh, travel uh, distance uh, since they will deliver uh, more uh, new highways and better uh, railway, electric uh, railway infrastructures. So in the, in the future, we will have even better connectivity. Now, a little bit about the few words about the development and uh, how the development uh, uh, started here uh, decades ago. About uh, the last uh, four or five decades that uh, we have the, the, the tourism, uh, since I remember, um, everything, everything started uh, on, uh, on automated pilot. I will say it was like uh, driving a Tesla car, but off-road. Um, there was no serious planning or uh, strategic uh, from, from the local government. And uh, basically the, the tourist model here was uh, based in a very, very, very big percentage on escorted tour groups, day trips uh, or um, uh, trips uh, that uh, had maximum one night stay, stay with uh, big uh, coaches. Uh, that was not a very sustainable uh, model of tourism. Um, we ended up um, we ended up um, a destination uh, that was uh, based uh, on quantity over quality, and you understand very very well what I mean with that. Yeah, the last few years we saw a slow but steady change. It was a swift into a different and more sustainable model that was not the result of a policy again. Uh, it was, uh, or, or any serious planning from, uh, from the administration, but uh, mainly it was uh, because of the digital era and all, and all these uh, changes that came uh, along with the new way of travel and uh, that the, the new technologies brought. Just to mention uh, Google Maps, uh, TripAdvisor, Airbnb, Booking.com, and website, websites that are making uh, the planning and the, and the how, how we travel much, much easier. So we, we had more and more people uh, that uh, they will come individually to visit uh, Matera. And that uh, brought a lot of uh, opportunities, especially the last uh, five, five, 10 years. Uh, furthermore, we have better cars, better roads, faster trains. So, so, so people in general feel much more uh, confident to travel uh, on their own instead of joining, uh, joining a group. Uh, we, we, we believe that the pandemic will surely increase, to say the least, uh, that uh, trend in the future. Now, the main, uh, the main challenge, the main problem our destination must try to resolve as soon as the tourism will uh, recover is the impact of uh, over tourism. Uh, when tourism will eventually recover in the next few years, I mean, hopefully in the next few months, but I don't see it, uh, we will probably see the old, same, the same old problems again. The same old problems, which is over tourism at the core of the destination, 
and no tourism at all at the, peri uh, at the periphery of the, of the destinations. This is a, a big challenge that we have to try to find solutions today, tomorrow. Uh, and another challenge that uh, it's pretty much the same in many other destinations is the limited time that the visitors are willing to dedicate uh, when, when they visit the destination. This is, this is not a new problem. Uh, the question is how we can convince the visitors to spend one more day or a few more hours here in the destination. Uh, because it's not about the quantity, uh, it's about the quality. And you can, you can have few people that they will stay longer, they're gonna do slow, slow tourism, and they're gonna spend more time, they're gonna dive into the destination and they will spend a lot of money if they stay here one more day. Um, our team uh, here in Visit Meteor, we strongly believe that the answer and the challenge is to make the experiences the cornerstone of the destination marketing of the destination. It's, it's, it's very, very important to that, to, see, to, to show to the people that here you can do this, you can do that, you can do unique and mindful experiences uh, in the planning process. And then they will decide to, to stay one more time. We have tested that and uh, yes, it works. We have to do it better. We have to do it more. Um, the, the second pillar uh, of the destination uh, of the region here is the countryside, uh, the beautiful uh, rural area of the nearby mountains. And I'm speaking about uh, Pindos and uh, Hasha mountains, uh, which is uh, an unexploited and untouched natural area. The economy here is purely agricultural, uh, agricultural and farming. Uh, with great quality of food products. So the, there is, a, a, you, know, you know, the region of Thessaly and especially the Western Thessaly has the reputation as the best uh, area that produce the finest uh, food products in Greece. And I'm speaking not only for um, uh, vegetables and fruits and stuff like that, but also for milk products, uh, for cheese and for meat production uh, and also for wine. Uh, and the economy around there in the periphery is mostly agricultural uh, and farming, but uh, it has some great characteristics, uh, especially for the new trends that are shaping after the pandemic. And we have to see how we can exploit that destination because we have a lot to earn. Uh, the, this place has amazing history, uh, wildlife, there is a ski resort, uh, there are uh, stone-made bridges, uh, picturesque villages. There is a, a virgin forest, wilderness, white rivers. And over there, you can do a variety of nature-based activities in that region. Uh, currently, unfortunately, this area, which is just a few minutes drive from Meteor, is not taking a, a single slice from the pie of tourism. And, this is a big challenge and we have to find the way both private and uh, public uh, development agencies to see how we, we can change that. Um, the main problems uh, here um, are related with the human resources since the population that have been left behind after some big migration waves that we had in the, in the past uh, are in general older people and farmers Old, older people. And uh, secondly, most of the visitors, it's connected with the problem that I mentioned earlier. Uh, they will come here, they will they will want to see the highlights, they, they will see the meteora, the monasteries, um, and then they're gonna move to the next highlight. They, they, it's very hard to convince a visitor to take a, a day from Mykonos or from Santorini uh, or from uh, Athens and uh, dedicated uh, to the destination. We have to, to fight hard in order to succeed, to succeed that. Um, <clears throat> the third pillar of, um, of the, our destination is the urban areas. Uh, mostly the, the, the city of Trikala and Kalabaka town, especially Trikala municipality over the last years, 
uh, became an example of innovation and, uh, and also became an example of uh, smart city practices, uh, not only national level, but uh, beyond the, the, the borders of Greece and uh, the cornerstone of uh, the tourism attraction of uh, Trikala City is uh, the biggest Christmas uh, theme park, the Mill of the Elves, which attract mainly domestic tourism, uh, but uh, succeed to bring over a million visitors uh, in a very short time of uh, window of time uh, during the Christmas uh, holiday. And uh, actually that initiative uh, succeed to, 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 to put um, our destination at the top of the choices of the Greek families for the Christmas holidays in the whole country. And uh, this is an example how from uh, one uh, initiative in a neighbor uh, municipality, uh, it was a win-win um, uh, situation uh, for, for, all, for all the destination. And uh, it filled up uh, some uh, empty gaps for the hotels, for the market uh, in early December, in uh, late November, uh, before the Christmas, because uh, all that people couldn't come, uh, of course, uh, on the 25th of December or on the 1st of January, because everything was fully booked. And we, say, we saw that the month before the holidays, which was not a very busy month before, uh, it, filled, it filled the gaps. And it was a, a great opportunity for the, for the tourist market of the, of the region. Now, to, to, to conclude, uh, I have to say here that we have uh, three, th there are three implementing initiatives for the destination marketing uh, of the region. We have the national uh, level uh, tourism boards, uh, the Greek tourism uh, organization and uh, Discover Greece, which is run from Marketing Greece. This is in, in a national level, of course. They do some efforts to, to, to market and uh, promote all the Greek destinations, of course. And uh, there is a, a regional level. Uh, one is uh, for, for the region of Thessaly. And uh, there is another one, a third uh, level, which is in a county level. It's um, uh, very important because this is um, for the regional unit uh, of Trikala uh, perfection. Um, the last six, seven years, there is an uh, effort to create a kind of a, a, D, a DMMO in the, region, in the region here, in the Trikala uh, unit. Uh, I have to say that the progress was quite slow. It, it took six years to do things that uh, we in the private sector, we usually, we need six months to, to do them, but uh, yeah, that is something that we know that uh, the public sector is, is quite slow. Um, but also we saw some uh, uh, some technical disorders. Uh, I can say we saw an example of comp competition between the stakeholders of uh, uh, Meteora and Trikala, mostly for branding related issues, uh, which is acceptable and equal rep representation uh, of the regions because now we speak about, you know, different cities, different towns, uh, some destinations have a different focus, a different orientation. Uh, but as I said before, we, at the end of the day, for the eyes of the international traveler, we are the same destination. Um, that initiative will solve a lot of um, problems uh, because uh, in the past we didn't have, um, and not only in the past, even today in small places like in Kalabaka, we don't have the, the knowledge workers and we don't have the budget in order to create a DMMO uh, with the international standards that uh, we, we see in the United States or in, in big other developed countries. So by combining forces, I, I think it was the wise decision to do it. Uh, now we have to try to, to resolve all these, um, all these disorders and try to, to go in the future with uh, uh, an optimism and uh, also we need to find a way to connect and synchronize all these different efforts. I have good news National... for you, George. I yeah? have really good news for you, which Looking is- Looking forward to hear. You are not alone. What you've described, what we've heard from Pablos, from Dimitris, from the mayor, from you, these are, the, there is a common thread of all of these challenges. 
And what you have here today with this group, and thank you very much for pulling it all together for us, because now we should get into some of that dialogue and start to bring up some of those points that you made and hear from some of our special guests to comment on that. So just, I wanna thank you for investing time, energy, and painting the picture for us locally. And thank you, Honorable Mayor, for jumping on. We know you keep a busy schedule and I've been looking forward to meeting you personally. So this is uh, quite a pleasure, thank you. Um, so Daniel, I'm gonna pass it right over to you. Thank you, Chris. I think this has been really interesting. And uh, as we aim to kind of like zoom into a destination, it couldn't be made in a more perfect way from Paulos to through Dimitris and to, to George. And uh, now we will hear from, from a group of people that we have invited to, to, the, to the panel. I uh, also want to, to say to everyone who might uh, be uh, from other places, uh, other destinations, that our future is about learning from each other, is about creating a community between destinations. And we think that we are all connected when it comes to our future. So that is why we are making the concept like this. Um, and uh, when we will present uh, the rest of the panel in, in uh, here, uh, I will give only 30 seconds each and you will say who you are and I will start. And I have already said who I am, so, but I will say it again because I also want to, 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 to say my nickname. My nickname is Daniel the Fearless in this group of, of, of specialists. And uh, I am a destination designer uh working with uh, destinations uh, mostly before it has been in in, in the nordics but uh, i see the same challenges i must say in all destinations uh, where, where we come not the least here in greece as well so over to to jane all right thank you i'll make this quick uh you can probably tell from my accent that i am here representing the united states i grew up in the rainy but beautiful pacific northwest but have spent the last 10 years in spain so i have an interesting perspective of a uh, american traveler as well as european um, my specialty is food tourism culinary tourism so how can destinations reach sustainable development by focusing on their culinary assets. That's it. Wow, great. And she's the Epicurean. Uh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and and Faka, you are the change architect. Good afternoon. Good evening, everyone. My name is Pagamile Shazo. I go by Paka. I am in South Africa. I'm in Joburg. And I'm the founder of Zulu Nomad, which is a social enterprise whose core purpose is to enable African tourism capacity and enterprise development at scale, and also the founder of In Africa, which is a marketplace connecting um, travelers to some of the really, really awesome experiences and hosts that we have all over this continent that you just won't find if you went and tried to look for yourself online. I'm very excited about today's discussion because there are such relatable issues and challenges which we see in so many different African destinations, which are absolutely stunning, but nobody knows about or nobody visits. You know, everyone comes to Cape Town and then off to Kenya and, you know, but you miss out on so much more in all of these destinations. So I'm very excited to hear um, more about our culinary opportunities and gastronomy um, and food and wine and culture. Very excited to be here today. Thank you. Thanks, Pekka. And uh, then we also have board. Hello, everybody. I'm board. I am a Norwegian. I uh, I've been uh, for 25 years. I've been running a consultancy, working with tourism development uh, all around Norway, planning, strategic planning, also with the working with sustainability. Uh, like uh, some of you have said already, the, the problems you are raising in Greece is the same problem that we have in Norway, in the Nordic countries as well. Maybe we have some different ways of dealing with them, but anyway, I think that um, uh, we, we can recognize it and I hope to, to be part of a discussion uh, with you. The last year I've been working with a new national strategy for Norway, a tourism strategy. It was delivered to the ministry 
just before uh, Easter now. So uh, we are looking in Norway to, to see how we can develop tourism in a more sustainable way for the future. That's a big issue in Norway as well. We, we don't, like you have talked about, we don't want to get back in the same situation with over tourism, too many people at the same build back better is also a discussion in Norway. How can we build back tourism better after the pandemic? Thank you. Okay, and uh, then we have uh, Melena. Melena, I cannot see you, but maybe Asta, you can fix that. But uh, meanwhile, uh, are you there, Melena? Yes, I am. I do apologize that I cannot go on uh, uh, on camera today, but you can see from my stunning photo that I look fabulously well. Um, my background <laughs> is in using um, human behavior to understand better the root causes of phenomena that we're trying to either understand or um, or resolve uh, in the context of tourism. So. Um, I often work on projects that seek to trigger behavior change of these root behaviors towards more sustainable or commercially successful tourism. The second important thing to know about me is that actually Greece is one of my favorite spots on the world. So those of you who um, usually speak to me know that uh, I often use Greek backgrounds to battle the Zoom fatigue that we are all victims of these days. Uh, so I'm especially thrilled to be connected to this group and to Greece by heart and soul, which already is a fact. So thank you for making me part of this. And uh, um, I'm, I'm really excited to be here today. Thanks. And then over to Iceland, to our nature lover, Asta Kristin. That's a really good name now when our, you know, mother nature is, yeah, having a scene yeah. here in, in Iceland. Uh, thank you for all this great talk. And, and I totally agree with uh, Paka who's saying that uh, these issues and, and challenges, they are all uh, the same in a way and, and we always find that uh, I mean of course they are not always exactly the same but but we can learn so much from each other uh, my role here is to manage a cluster uh, and and what you have described can all be fixed in a way uh, by managing a cluster from your area as well so we should just make a sister cluster in 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 your area to, to make this happen and, and, and bridge between. Uh, and me and Paul, we, we have experiences there, so we can help you bridge between the public and the private sector and, and help the public sector to, to run faster because we, we have no time to, to do things slowly now. We really need to do things fast and we need to do them well and we need to, of course, be sustainable while we do it. Thank you. Thank you, Elsta. And I, I will skip you because uh, you have already presented yourself, Dimitris and George and Pavlos and so. I think we, we have all uh, spoken now. Uh, Chris, you will also get some words, but I, I don't want to take too much of time because I want to leave the words to the panel. Uh, everyone who are listening to this, you're welcome to post any questions you would like to, to, to want to uh, our, uh, our panel to talk about. Uh, one thing that I would uh, just start to reflect on is uh, also I want to say to the panel that we will not talk too too long each, so we can you know have a little bit more uh, vivid and, and uh, short uh, inputs. Uh, but one thing that I, I really feel the, the similarity and what I have felt here today is how important the locals are for storytelling about the destination and. You are the best examples of that. You, George and Dimitris and Paulos that has actually been speaking here. And by saying that, I think it is really important. They also activate all the locals on the destination and have all the locals uh, involved in, in uh, when you are agreeing to plan together to, to build your destination and, and how you're setting the direction for, for building up the destination you would like to be. So that is my message uh, and, and over um, to the panel to reflect further. Um, I, I would like to hear maybe a board. I think it is quite interesting to hear about the kind of combination between 
nature and art and food because that is also what Norway has become very known for. Yeah. And please, uh, Anna, just unmute yourself so we can just have a bit of a talk. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but uh, I also, I, I just, Daniel, wanted to start in a little bit in a different, uh, with a different angle, uh, because I think that some, some of the things that we need to do in the future is, is to do more visitor management. We need to do more strategic planning. We need to you know, look at the resources we have and how can we develop them in a sustainable way. We need to we need to join forces. We need to create arenas where local people talk to politicians, talk to the one in ones in the industry. That's that's the way we do it. Like Oscar said, in the clusters as well. We need and we need to define a common future. We need to put some new words into the discussion. Not see tourism as an industry, we need to say, how, how is it going? Why do we want tourism? What is it good for? How can we use tourism as a tool for developing this local community? I think we need to start with discussing it, the development with other words, with other phrases, and we need to collaborate on this. It's not possible to, to develop tourism industry within its own bubble. It's not going, it's not going to be like that in the future. It needs to be opened up. And that means that the resources you're pointing at, the food, the local heritage, the nature, the people, the and the way we do planning for the future needs to be addressed in, in a new setting. Thank you. Uh, I got a, just a, in, a text here. Did you see the guys who are doing the, the rock climbing? Could you just pin Basileos, uh, Alsta, while we are taking the words further? Maybe, uh, Jane, do you have something? Maybe. Yeah, I do. Yeah, I think board that was a really great place to start. Um, and from my lens, when I start thinking about destination development and addressing these problems, you know, my lens comes from food. And I think that food is often a really safe, interesting, exciting place to start the conversation because normally uh, the dish that maybe the politician grew up with is the same dish that the farmer also grew up with. So there's this instant link of um, appreciation of the same value, right? There's this instant... Um, introspective moment where two people who maybe have lived different careers, different paths, can see the value that their local heritage has. I just wanted to grab a question that is here in the chat. Um, uh, is there a proven effective strategy for approaching funding from the public and private sectors for tourism, especially post COVID? And I just wanted to share because now we have for 14 or 15 weeks been working on this online accelerating program that we funded both public and privately. The companies paid a really small fee uh, and we uh, provided uh, into the funding and then from the public side. And the companies have been like in this accelerator now just learning and sharing and, and the most effective way for this to work is for them to share peer to peer. And in this horrific time that we have been going through right now, that is like mentally has been uh, like a life changer for, for them and, and, and making them so much more um, competitive and so much more ready to, to run when, when this all starts. So that is just uh, to prove that the concept works. Uh, this is not a funding system, but this is like a cooperation, public-private, to help the business owners uh, get more strength into their businesses right now. So, just an uh, opportunity for everyone to to jump in, uh, and I can give you all the you know heads up that we have been finding our way. Um, I would also like to, to say another thing when it comes to funding and also connecting to what board was pointing out is how we need to collaborate when it comes to tourists that it is not only its own bubble 
but it's also like the direct funding and also you have the, all the indirect funding. That is really important when you work uh, as I do with destination development uh, and see how we can use all the, the different kind of assets that, that we have uh, out there, all the public agencies that need to be uh, also connected to the destination strategy. We cannot only say that the DMO should have all the money and then you can try to do uh, the marketing and, and, and all of that. But it is, it is about uh, collaboration in, in all kinds of like, because uh, tourism is not its own bubble. Uh, whether you like tourism or not, you're part of tourism. Uh, so I think that is why it is also so important to actually focus on the residents uh, first. And uh, if you focus on the residents and make the residents proud of your place and uh, make the, the, the res residents to become great storytellers, that will also benefit the destination mm -hmm. in marketing wise as well. So yeah. further reflections. I, I just want to say that in Norway now, there is, if you, if you want public grants for developing a destination, you need to have a strategic plan. You need to have a master plan for the development of the destination. And it needs to be made in common with the politicians, with the local society, with the businesses. And, that, and we also have now a sustainable development, a sustainable destination label so you can get the label and then you have some uh, defined, you, you have to have a defined process in order to find out how can we make this destination more sustainable. And you have a process involving, uh, again, both the private and public sector and you, and you put set some goals for the development, but you also have some obligations. And then afterwards you get funding for working with this plan afterwards. It's a way of stimulating the destinations to deal more with destination management and also to find the right way of developing the destination. But that's Norway and it's different. I don't know how it is in Greece. Mm -hmm. So I'm actually curious to hear from Jane and Dimitri around the opportunity to actually help communities understand how to actually go about creating these food experiences, these wine experiences. So one of the things that George mentioned, for example, was that the part of Greece produces the finest foods and it's already popular within the country as, as this place where all this amazing food comes from. How does, how does the community then use that, that existing hype about it um, to actually draw people to A, the destination, but also make sure that by the time the people get there, there's actually a tourism product around the food that has been created. Yeah, that's a great question. And that's basically the, the base of building food tourism in a destination is first you have to understand the value that's there, what's unique, what's memorable, what's characteristic. Um, and that plays into the, the place branding of the area. So once you have the product, yeah, the next step is to turn it into a, an attraction or a tourism product. And this can be done different levels. It can be done, I think, uh, currently my favorite, my favorite way is in combination with other types of tourism. So take, for example, cycling tourism. So cycling tourism with maybe a local lunch in a type of farm where you try the, the, the local products. So you're, maybe initially people aren't traveling all the way out to that new region for that specific product, but they're there enjoying the nature, enjoying the art. Why, why wouldn't they want to enjoy this tourism product? So there is some complications sometimes um, when you're talking with local farmers and they're thinking, all I, all I want to do is to produce my product, why would, I, why would I be interested in tourism? What's, what's in it for me or that's too much work or I'm too busy. And so I think that's when the collaboration, the private public collaboration really comes into play to offer those farmers, producers, the tools maybe to help them build a website 
or you know the the, the simple tools to create an accessible tourism product. I'm not sure, Dimitris, if you have other comments. I, I totally agree with you, Jane. So just to, if, if we were to, to kind of zoom out and, and have like a helicopter view and, and in all things I'm saying, I'm not a pessimist. I don't see the negative side of things. It's just that I think we need to face the problems in order to, to move into change and have a brighter future. So first, one of the first things when we're talking about food tourism and let's say even, even culture, uh, is if we Greeks ourselves and the locals support it. So right now, what is the local diet in the region of Thessaly? How many of the local families, what do they eat? Do they still eat traditionally? Because let's say in the case study of, of, uh, of Crete, Crete is the motherland of the Mediterranean diet of all these wonderful pro uh, products. And right now we have amongst the highest uh, levels of uh, diabetes and obesity in Europe. So if we, are not, if we don't support our own culture, traditions, land products, then we, we, we must not expect the visitors to do, to do that for us. Uh, one of the other things is what resources are we, are, are we working with? Because I have, I have had the chance to be in some Zoom calls lately with some destinations, et cetera. And there, are, there, is, there is a lot of energy. I see a lot of passion and there are brilliant ideas. We have people which have the grandmothers, which have uh, 150 recipes from a specific place. But it's like, and, and here's where, where we would like your help as well from what you see in other countries. It's like walking into a classroom and asking a hundred children to bring their favorite pen. Yeah. Every single person has, has, has their own idea. How do you put that in, into context and decide what first? Because in, in Hios, for example, there might be over 200 recipes. We cannot build food tourism in a year with, with, uh, with, a, with a plateau of 200 recipes. That's, that's one of the things. So what are we working with? And, spe and, and a key to this will be specialization because each area can play their own role. And this is where we can find the, the let's say the, the flow between them and send them from one, one area to the other. And this is going to be also important in, in terms of keeping the promise. Uh, we've seen with Sadorini, for example, which got uh, a destination protected origin of fava, and everybody started knowing fava from Santorini. There are other islands of the Kikladis and other parts of Greece which also cultivate fava. How many kilos of fava do we cultivate a year? All tourists visiting Sadorini are expecting to have fava. This is not possible. So we need to, to, to work with our resources. Again, the, and sorry, sorry, Chris, the, the, the farmer is also necessary to be part of this because we are also hearing a lot of things about agritourism here in Greece. And there is a total gap in legislation because agritourism is for uh, people who have apartments and have also put a couple of fields and animals, and it's not for the farmer. To, to have an alternative source of income. And the final point, which I don't see it being mentioned, and maybe it's because it's later on and we will see how we will solve it, but let's try to fix things from the start, is how we will find the balance. Right now with Airbnb experiences, and because it's a, a, an area where I am, I am very interested in, we see a lot of locals getting involved in experiences we will have the same problems we're having with short-term rentals and hotels, we will have with experiences. If we allow each person to decide what kind of cooking class they will, they will do, and we start having in Meteora, 10 people making the same pies, the dol dolmadakia like we're making in the rest of Greece and Turkey is also doing it and uh, Lebanon, etc. We need to find the balance of the products and the, the product 
uh, creation we're going to do so we can have a, a nice setup and 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 um, and uh, in general have a well balanced uh, quality tourism offering the people uh, like to eat like the locals locality in food yeah. if you offer to the visitors the very local places where you go to eat breakfast where you go to have your coffee where you like to grab something sweet and when you usually go with your friends and with your family for a dinner or for a lunch this is what they will appreciate they, they want to go out of the tourist map they, 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 they want authenticity and locality so when you build up a product a food tour the first priority the first question you have to ask her to, to yourself is where are you going to go to eat with your friends mm. and offer that to the people and they will appreciate it the most I, I offer a, a private food and wine tour in that region where there are no visitors yet. You remember I mentioned about the periphery of uh, the core of our destination here, which is uh, not taking a single slice for the, from the pie of tourism. Yeah, the last couple of years, I'm taking uh, families, couples uh, on a private basis, people in that area. And we are doing a food and wine tour. And the people very often make exactly the same comment. The, 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 at the end of the tour, they, thought, they told me, George, this is the highlight of our, our entire trip in Europe. And we have been uh, joining the best uh, food tours in France and wine tours in Italy just before we come here. And uh, I'm, I'm a little bit, hey, why are you saying that you make me and the answer, but, but I think it is, uh, yeah. the answer is locality, locality. Yeah. The fact that they didn't show other tourists, travelers, say better, around them, made them feel unique, gave them exactly the experience uh, they were seeking. But there's so also the like, there, there could be a threshold there because the locals, this can only be possible while the locals are still on board. Uh, and when you don't have the balance, maybe anymore, because this will be become so popular, then you then you lose the locality and the authenticity also. So it's always about the balance and, and holding that close. I, I yeah, think it is about to, you. You need to dare to be yourself. That is what it's all about, and that is what uh, what is it? It is about looking yourself in the mirror and try to be the best of yourself. And it's quite common when you come to destinations all over the world, it's the same that it is about what, what should you bring out from the best from this destin destination. It's about always trying to get the destination to understand yourself and to actually understand that sometimes I think it is quite common that destinations are home blind and don't understand that what you are is what we want. And I think it is also, um, quite clear i think we make it much more complex than we should need to do it because if you look uh, to yourself if you travel somewhere no matter where you travel what would you like to see and how would you like to experience things would you like to have the all-inclusive uh, you know food experience that you eat the same food as you eat uh, at home uh, wherever you go no that is not what you want you want to the, have the authentic experience and i think um, yeah sometimes it is easy but it is not always that easy to be yourself uh, i think that is also something that you might see when when for example me uh, chris others who work with tourism actually come from outside and have the outside ex experience outside perspective you kind of see have more cl uh, clear vision on things like this. Um, so so uh, on, that point, on that point, Daniel, so another thing that George mentioned was how, you know, how do we compete with travelers? How do we get, how do we attract travelers who would typically go to Athens and Santorini? Um, as someone who's been to both of those destinations, if I had known about how great the rest of the country is, I absolutely would have planned a return trip 
to Greece and go to a different part of the country that I haven't experienced before. Greece is easy enough for me to get to from South Africa. The flights are affordable. I don't have visa issues. So it's a great destination already. And as someone who's been to Athens and, and Santorini and had a wonderful time, I absolutely would be back. So maybe it's not targeting first time visitors to the destination, but visitors who've already had some kind of exposure um, to the country and its destination and, and, and attract them then to come back and experience something new. Mm -hmm. Totally agree with this. And we have experienced this in, in Iceland, for example, that uh, because we have a lot of land, although we are really small populated, but uh, first comers, they just want to be in the capital area, but then when people come the second time around, then we can offer them the real deal. <laughs> Melena, are you there? We need you. Yes, I am. <laughs> I'm, I'm trying I can't to spotlight listen. her. <laughs> Sorry. Yes, apologies for that. I'm, I'm trying you, to you're balance like God. Between... We don't see you, but we <laughs> between uh, listening to the conversation, but also um, following the, the exceptionally interesting um, chat dynamics, which, which are quite... Um, in any case, what I wanted to, to say, and that uh, would kind of build up also on, on, on Daniel's point, is that I actually think that Greece has, in general, and, and Western Tel Thessaly as, as well, have a, a great advantage um, and that's the opportunity to actually be much bolder than many other destinations in redesigning tourism and recovering in a way that actually is closer to the heart and soul of the Greek spirit. And Greece in general and the regions within it with the wealth of culinary, natural, cultural, human assets that they have can actually afford to do tourism the way that they want and the way that best reflects their spirit and um, uh, what makes them happy. Um, while other destinations have actually to go through loops between attracting travelers and then also doing it in a way that follows um, some of these principles, in this case, we have a destination which is already one of the most desired in the world. And so the different regions have so much to offer and so much to highlight um, that they can afford to actually set the rules and invite guests just the same way that we do in our homes by setting the principles. And these principles can be anything from, you know, and any food service that you experience in Greece is, um, you know, a 10 mile uh, food product. So everything is 100% locally. And that's actually a great way to recover from, from this crisis because it ensures much higher share of the economic um, profit that stays in the local economy, something that all of us will need badly after the market comes back. Um, you can also say that, you know, you're welcome, you, we will offer the, the, the traditional and authentic spirit, but we uh, will do that without a single use plastic, we will do that in a, um, in a sustainable and locally respectful way, and so on. So to me, one of the things that I would love to see in the next year is actually individual regions and Greece as a whole actually be a leader in being much bolder and setting its own rules in order to actually manage proactively the perceptions and attitudes, something that Dimitris talked about early on and something that Pavlos mentioned in his fabulous introduction that being proactive and acting instead of waiting is what, uh, what can be a rewarding strategy, especially in this context when destinations are looking to figure out ways to, to recover. So to me, um, you're sitting on gold and you can transform that into becoming a model for recovery that the others can follow. You can kind of feel I'm biased towards Greece, right? <laughs> I, think, I think it's good. Uh, maybe Chris, you are the dreamer. If you have some final words and then we will actually start to close this session because it's almost two hours. Uh, so wow. the dreamer, can you say something? 
Yeah, but my dream may may shock the system in in uh, Meteora uh, a bit. Um, and and I shared with Pavlos years ago my dream about how could Greece reverse the extraordinarily heavy, heavy damage done by resort developments in the 60s, 70s, and 80s? And what if some of those old places could be torn down? And what if uh, those areas could be restored to their natural uh, look and feel? And uh, I take that concept to Meteora. One of the biggest shocks I had in my, in my tourism, my professional tourism career, and I think I shared the, this with George, so I don't think it'll be a too much of a shock for you. But I, I came to Meteora and saw this unearthly vision, mystical land and everything. And I was hiking up in the area and then I ran across pavement, blacktop highway through the monastic center, uh, through Meteora. My dream would be for Greece to get in there and take those highways out and, and restore Meteora to its original state. So that's my dream. There are ways to do it. There are ways to retain the nature. There are ways to, to uh, ensure that the, the revenues stay with the local population. But it's a crazy dream, but I keep having it. And I wanna see that done one day. You asked. I like that provocative uh, thoughts and uh, that you have uh, and uh, dreams. Uh, uh, I think that is also what we need. And, and, and by saying that, I think it is also really important to actually question what is the norm. And sometimes when you work, as you say, you're working to set up a DMMO, uh, it is also like sometimes you get a little bit too strict in, in those contexts. Uh, I think the, the, the uh, destination organization is really important to have. It's important to measure the, the progress and understand what is happening, uh, not only on working with the marketing, but actually management. But I think it is also really important to leave space for pro provocative thoughts and provocative ideas. And uh, we will, uh, I will let in by saying that uh, you might be surprised, Ulf, because I want you to get into the conversation because you will host the next, uh, our future Jokmok. And uh, our future Jokmok is uh, based in, in Swedish Lapland. Can you pin uh, Ulf uh, as that? So he will be more visible. Uh, but when I think about Swedish Lapland, it is very much about innovation. It's about place innovation. Swedish Lapland is the home of the worldwide known uh, ice hotel. You have the tree hotel, you have Arctic baths, you have a lot of, of really unique experiences. So when we talk about experiences, that is one thing, but how do you actually dig where you stand? Not only make experiences that you are copy, copying someone else, but actually look at where you stand and, and see what you can do from, from, from your own soil in that sense, yeah. So Ulf, uh, would you like to say something? Because uh, you will host the next, uh, our future Jokmok. Well, thank you, Daniel, and thanks all of you for a fantastic webinar. This, this is so brilliant. I mean, despite so many of you, I'm not really a tourist expert. I've been working with development issues for 30 years or more in Europe and in Sweden. But for tourism, it, it has been more like, well, you know, something along all the other stuff. But now we are running a small place up here in the Jokmok in the northernmost part of Sweden. We are, we could call it the Arctic region. We have borders towards Norway and Finland as well in Norwegian. So we are really in a way in the Arctic district. It's really a remote place as well. Even if it's fully functional, very modern and so on, in all kinds of senses, I would say, but, but still we're quite far away from the rest of the world. But, but, but also in many ways, I would say, at least for today, we do, we could uh, actually host a lot of the trends in, in, in travel businesses that we see uh, among travelers today. So that's really interesting. And, and it, it, we would say that for the last 10 years, the whole region as such as a destination has been really successful. We have doubled our, our 
rate of overnight stays and so on. And even in my community, Yokmak, we, we managed to exceed that. I guess for in, in, a, in the year of number eight in the 10 years perspective, we managed to double our, or reach the, the regional level. <clears throat> so we had a tremendous um, pros, progress in that sense, but still we have this kind of white spot uh, following the year. We have uh, uh, seasons that we don't really use. So we, have, we still have, even if you say we are a kind of innovative region down here, we still, still have a lot to work on with that. Yeah, and we we Jokmak is really, it is really as you see. I think maybe maybe yeah. I will just stop you there. So people, it is a little bit of a cliffhanger. So people yeah. who are here today actually want to join on the twenty eighth of April right. when we go to Jokmak, and uh, please do that because this is the purpose of all of this. That you who have now uh, joined us from Greece. You will follow us to Jokmok. And also we have had people from Rwanda. We had Greg Bakunsi joining us from, from Rwanda. We had also people from Österland, from East Iceland joining us. And together we're building up kind of a community where we can learn from each other. And after all of these sessions, we will also follow up and, and connect all of us together and maybe create projects together and, and all of that. Uh, by saying this, I would like to, to let in again, Paulos, uh, you would like to say some, some words here in the let, end. Let me just say a big thank you because this has been extremely enlightening, as enlightening as I had uh, hoped for. And um, many of the ideas that were mentioned here are, are fantastic and they're, they're really important for Greece. Um, Chris, uh, would you, 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 the vision you described is, is, is absolutely wonderful. My father used to say that the visioners of the future will not build things, they will destroy things. I think uh, you're in tune there, you're, you're, you're in tune there and <laughs> it explains a lot as to our relationship, but, uh, and, and your nickname as well. But, uh, but I do believe that uh, starting simple is, is really important and um, simple to, to me means finding what you, what you love what you love doing, what you, what, you, what you appreciate about your own country and, and being natural in what you do in order to, 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 to promote what you, what, what you love about it. And um, if, if I, I had the opportunity to look at what we, we had done as a, as a destination, as Greece uh, in the past years. And I remember when hotels used to have hospitality, um, uh, British hospitality as being the, the epitome of good hospitality. And we tried to to explain to all the Greek workers in hotels that they have to act like the British and that didn't work. And then we thought that Indonesia was the peak of hospitality and, and we tried to get everybody to, to act that way and that didn't work. And then suddenly something happened that completely changed the way that the Greek um, worker, a, a, a Greek, um, a, a Greek um, person working in a, in, in a hotel that, that, that snapped differently. And that was that we became more true to our, to our own kind of hospitality. And our kind of hospitality is come and make yourself at home. If, if you were to put it in a phrase, it means that my home is your home and I will share with you everything that I have. Um, don't expect from me maybe the absolute, um, um, you know, uh, typical, um, uh, type of, of, of hospitality. Don't expect that you will find what you will find in a different destination. But whatever it is that I enjoy, whatever it is that I love, I will share with you in order for you to get to love my country, which is what a Greek is passionate about. We love people who love our country. So, so, um, so, so becoming true to yourself and finding what is, what is of value to you is, I think, the first step. And that's why we need to go out there, find all those uh, all those areas that can create wealth, start putting them down and seeing what it is that is blocking them today in order to make them known worldwide. And I think uh, having your help in this in this effort is, is is huge. And thank you, thank you again for doing this. Wonderful, Pavlos. Thank you. Uh, what a fantastic way to sum up. <laughs> what we've done here. And I remember you telling me that story before or that that uh, offering me that perspective. And it was just a great reminder. And I think it's a good reminder for everyone here. George. Yeah, I want to also say a special thank you to all of you 
it was a, a great honor. And I will close with a saying that never, never has there been before, never has there been a more important time to understand the future of travel. While there are plenty of reasons to be pessimistic right now, optimism sh should be a choice. Because when you see the world through the lens of positivity, you can start seeing opportunities instead of challenges. So with that uh, optimist uh, message, I want to thank you all and uh, send you my warmest greetings from a wonderful destination. And I hope to see you soon here in the, in the beautiful footpaths of, uh, of Meteora and walk together. Thank you, George. Thank you to all of the participants who stayed on throughout the entire program. Thank you to our special guest contributors today. Uh, Pablos, once again, thank you. And again, George, I'm not sure if the mayor is still on, but please do extend our gratitude. Demetris, really appreciated your extra insights today. Thanks for that, Mr. Pure Energy. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much, Chris. Uh, I think this was a wonderful discussion and we must understand that we're not alone. Uh, there are people facing uh, similar issues and there is no secret recipe. We must find our own Greek recipe in terms of managing and, and uh, growing our tourism and we must build it and then promote it. Uh, and, and one of my personal goals is we need the destination managers in Greece, which will understand the fundamentals. And these might be politicians, the, this might be the grandma, this might be the hotel owner, it has to be everyone. We, we need local leaders, which will understand the fundamentals of tourism and will help us build, build back better and build better. Thank you very much. And we have the resources with a big, nice recovery package coming from the EU. Let's uh, grab this opportunity and make it work. I see a sister exchange program coming. So I really like that idea. Daniel, any last things or should we just say, see everyone on the 28th of April in Yokmok? Yeah. Exactly, we are going to, to Jokmok and that will be, and then you know, Jokmok is actually the, the capital of the Samis. So it will be a very exciting and exotic place to go to and uh, it will be very, very cold still, I, I believe. Right, Wolf? <laughs> um, well, not too bad. Uh, not too bad, okay, it's better than, yeah. But uh, anyhow, uh, this is a great way to, to just uh, say goodbye to all of you. And uh, I hope to, to see you soon again, soon again. And I hope, uh, hope that you all uh, want to join us in, uh, in uh, Jokmok. Uh, and also, if you know any other place in the world that would like to make an, our future program, just let us know, because we are here. And, the globe is, is our playground for this. So thank you okay. and uh, ciao, goodbye. Hey, do. Hey, do. Bye bye, everybody. Bye bye.